the spring as well. Uh, but external feeders require considerably less equipment. Okay, I can feed an entire yard of beans from one location, and I only have to service that one set of feeders. Uh, requires a lot less equipment, but you don't know who you're feeding. Okay, you're feeding the world. I mean, your bees are coming to my yard, your bees are coming to my yard, and all of my strong hives, they're in there, and those two weak hives, hopefully they're getting in there and getting some too, but I am, I am spreading it wide, okay? So some of the downsides to external feeders. Okay, so let's, we're gonna just kind of wrap up here. We're gonna go through um, a couple of different kinds of feeders. If anybody bought a new beekeeping kit from someplace, it almost certainly came with one of these. Who, who here does not have a Gordon feeder kicking around somewhere in their equipment? You do not. Would you like one? <laughs> okay. Everybody gets one of these. Okay. And the reason is, is because they are cheap. Uh, they are cheap and they are easy to use. This is the one I said is, is that we're going to talk about internal, external, and one that's kind of in between. This is the kind of in between one. It, it is, I think, technically an internal feeder because the opening is inside the hive. However, it's so close to the entrance of the hive that anybody flying around out here, whether it's your hive or not, can smell that food, and they're coming in to take some. So kind of inside, outside sort of thing. Um, they do work well. Uh, you take your own mason jar and you screw it onto this cap that's set in here. It's a standard mason jar lid with these little holes poked in it. And Boardman feeders operate under the same principle that a lot of feeders do, which is the vacuum principle. If you poke little holes in a jar full of liquid and you tip it upside down, a vacuum forms in there. And as the bees take drops of feed away from those holes where they start to poke out, the air goes up inside and a little bit more drips down. It doesn't drain away. Uh, and, and that's a way that the, that the bees can get food without being drowned. So boardman or entrance feeders, um, not my first choice. I don't know any experienced beekeeper who uses them extensively, uh, in part because they only hold a quart, which is not a lot of feed, and they tend to just be somewhat problematic. But they work. Um, division board feeders. These are the these are these are these are one of the big ones in use. Lots of people use division board feeders. Who's got division boards? Yeah, lots of people got it. Um, this is a real common design. They vary a bit from manufacturer to manufacturer, but what they do is they actually replace one or more frames in the brood box. So they actually sit inside the hive. You take a couple of frames out. You put the division board feeder in. What it is, is sort of a, a plastic tub that's shaped like one or more frames as far as its dimensions. And sitting down inside of it are these little socks uh, made of plastic. They're called ladders, bee ladders. And the bees go down inside the opening here. They crawl down into here to the level of the food. They take it and they climb back out. Um, these are very good feeders. They work really, really well. <clears throat> and the bees, uh, tend to take to them very readily. You don't get a lot of drowning issues in here because these uh, bee ladders are very secure and the bees are able to keep, keep uh, a hold of them and they work really well. Um, what's the main downside of these? Can you think of one? You have to open up your whole hive. You gotta open up your whole hive. Okay, that's one. How about more downsides? You have to take out some frames. You gotta take frames out. You've just made your hive smaller. Okay, if you've got a five frame nuke, would you want to use one of these? No. Nah, probably not. I mean, if it's something you had, maybe, <clears throat> but you're going to make your frame your nuke at least a four frame nuke all of a sudden. Um, also, remember what I said about the size of every bee feeder's hole? It's about that big around. Okay, standing on the side of the hive and pouring syrup into these can be challenging if you're not equipped for it. I finally went to a big plastic watering can that I fill and then take it around and I they're pour it in. You watch commercial beekeepers, they will have a, a truck with a tank on it and a, and a gasoline powered pump and a big long hose with a filler on it that looks like a gas pump. So let's go along every hive will get a little shot of juice uh, from that. So they work well, they hold up well, uh, but they do have some downsides. All right, here's one you may not have seen before. Has anybody used a baggie feeder? I have. <clears throat> you have too. Okay, this is probably the cheapest way to feed bees. I mean, if you went out to the hive today, 
and said, oh my God, I've got to get feed on them and I don't have any feeders. You can do this. And it works. It doesn't seem like it should work, but it does. You take a Ziploc bag. Uh, these are quart sizes here, but you can do it with gallons. Um, it's a little, it's just a touch trick here to do with gallons. You fill the bag up with syrup, a mess, granted. You zip it tight, you lay it down flat on top of the bars, and then you take a razor blade. Very important, you must use a razor blade or, or a really, really sharp jacket. Uh, and you cut a slit about that long to the top of the bag. The syrup does not come pouring out. Okay? There's enough tension on that bag that it holds that, that cut just barely together. But it's enough so that the bees can get up on there and they'll start taking that syrup out. And you'll come back in a couple of days and that bag will be just flat. They will have taken everything out. They will have gone inside and cleaned it out. They may have built some comb in there and started to raise brood in there. <laughs> These work really well. Okay. Downside? What's the downside? It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. If you do it wrong, you can you can cause a flood, um, which does happen. Um, if you notice here, you see this little spacer rim that he's got around the hive? That's called an eck. An eck is just what it sounds like. It's a spacer. You can't put the top right back down on top of this, can you? You've got to have some more equipment, something that you can use to raise up the inner cover above that bag. So this does require more equipment of some sort. Okay? Could be anything. You know, could be another super like this guy is using here. Uh, could be just an eck, but something. So you've got to have a little bit more equipment. All right, uh, this is, I think, probably the largest capacity internal feeder that I know of, and it's called a hive top feeder. Most of these will hold several gallons of syrup. Um, if you're going to see your hives once a month or once every couple of weeks, this is the feeder you want to use. There's a whole variety of them out there. Uh, this is a home-built one. I have made them before out of wood. Uh, you can do it out of wood. It doesn't really leak. You just caulk up the joints real good, and... Uh, and, and it works fine. Um, this is one I think that Man Lake sells that is basically a plastic insert that you drop into one of your supers. And so the super actually is the framework, and all you have to buy is this, this plastic insert. The way it works is, is that this channel in the middle is actually open on the bottom. The bees can go up inside there, and they come out these little slots at the top, and that screen mesh is about that far away from the plastic Okay, and so the bees are able to climb down that mesh to wherever the level of syrup is, get their food, and go back up, down the slot, and back down into the hive. They work really well, um, but they are big. They are moderately expensive, uh, and again, it requires more equipment. Okay, so you're going to spend a little bit more to equip a hive with a hive top feeder, but you're probably going to worry about it less than you would just about any other kind of feeder because once you fill it up, you're good to go. Other than the cost of equipment, can you see a downside to this? Yes? Drowning issues, like this drowning issues. Yes, you can end up with drowning issues. Bees will lose their drip in here and they will fall in and drown and they can clog this thing up and make a royal mess out of it. I heard if you put straw or hair, just anything on the top of it. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> That's coming. Good idea, though. <laughs> Any other issues? Yes. They are heavy, so if you want to take it out, it's yeah. much like slushy, slushy, it's, and it's, it's it's dump it. Yeah. Yep. A couple of gallons of syrup oh, weighs 16, 18 pounds. These don't have enough room. They'll build comb in that channel. They will build comb in it. Okay. <laughs> Here's one. How long does syrup last before it goes bad? Depends on how hot it is. Depends on how hot it is. Depends on what you put in it. But in warmer weather, this may hold more syrup than your bees are going to eat before it goes bad. Uh, and so uh, bees don't like moldy syrup. Uh, and so uh, if you use one of these in warmer weather, uh, you want to keep an eye on it. All right, bucket feeders. Uh, real popular with the, with the commercial uh, feed with the commercial folks, uh, and because they are cheap, 
they work well, and they take a reasonably small amount of labor to manage. The idea behind a bucket feeder or any top feeder other than the kind I just showed you is kind of the same. They pretty much all operate on this vacuum principle. A bucket feeder specifically uh, uses the inner cover, which is right here, and most inner covers have that oblong hole in the middle of them. Okay, that's the access to the feeder. The bucket is filled with syrup, okay, and the lid's put on and it's sealed tight. And either there's a series of really small holes punched in the top, or you can have one of these little fancy inserts that you plug in there that basically creates the spot for the bees to feed. You take that bucket, you flip it upside down over the hole in the inner cover, and then you put another uh, hive body on top of here in your inner cover, in your, or your, your, and then your outer cover, sorry, not your inner cover, in your outer cover. And so the whole thing is inside the hive, okay? Advantages here, depending on the size bucket you use, you can put one, two, three gallons of feed on a hive in one visit. You're not really cranking the whole hive open to service it. All you're doing is taking the lid off and pulling that thing off of the inner cover. So it's not quite as much of a, of a, of a mess. Uh, and uh, buckets are pretty cheap and easy to come by. So it does require equipment. You've got to have more woodenware. You've got to have some high body to put around it. Okay, you've got to have extras, but it works really, really well. Ah, there we go. Um, same type of principle, but with other types of feeders. Um, there's a whole variety of feeders out there. There are, uh, this is kind of an adaptation of the Wardman feeder. You can see them with two, sometimes with four. This is sitting over the hole in the inner cover. There's a hollow space underneath here. The bees come up inside, they take the feed. Uh, you can put your boardman feeders out there, good place for them, uh, fill the whole upper super with them. Uh, you go cheap. Uh, and you can feed there. Um, you can put uh, purpose-built feeders up there. Uh, there's several different varieties. So there's a lot of different ways you can use this sort of hive top feeder concept. The common factor is, is that you've got to have the woodenware to enclose them in. Okay? So if you only own, if you have one hive and you've got two deeps and a couple of supers, if you're going to do any of these techniques, you're going to have to get at least another deep box. So say the downside of that center bottom one is they're going to have a crap load of burk home in there. They are going to have a crap load of burk home in there. That's right. Because as you keep feeding them, you're stimulating them not only to raise brood, but what else? To build home. I'm not advancing. Here, make it go. Thank you. Um, high top jar feeders. Uh, this is another uh, way to do it. This is actually how I feed all of my nukes. Um, I have a hole cut in the lid, uh, like you see, kind of like here. And uh, I put a mason jar feeder. Uh, two triple A's. But I think the battery's okay for them. No, no. Um, Anyway, uh, I, and, I, and I use uh, mason jar feeders like this and just plug them right in the hole, hole the size to fit the feeder. Uh, you can make them to take any bottle you want. As is shown here, I have no idea what they're feeding. Um, it looks disgusting. But apparently the bees are taking them, so they're going to mix some pollen sub with their feed. Uh, but uh, the point is, is that you can you put the feeder on the outside. Now, the reason I do this, or one of the reasons I do this with my nukes, is because I don't take up space inside the hive with the feeder, and the holes I have cut in the tops have a piece of mesh underneath them. So I'm not opening the hive at all. I just go grab those quart jars, pop them off. There's a screen that's keeping all the bees inside. I switch it out with a full one, pop it back on. I don't even have to suit up. I just go right down the line, pop, 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 pop put them all in there. So it's very easy to do. You can do it with a full-size hive if you want to. You just have to cut a hole in your outer cover, which you know, may or may not want to do. All right, um, <clears throat> last couple of things. Uh, external feeders. Um, there are several of them on the market. Not as many as you would think, because they're fairly easy to build. Uh, the most common ones you see are ones like the, the ones here on the right. Uh, which are made basically from a five-gallon bucket. Um, if you get on Google and put uh, five-gallon bucket bee feeder, 
you'll find a bunch of sites that will show you how to modify a couple of five gallon buckets uh, to work as external bee feeders. I mean, here you're feeding 10 gallons of syrup in one location for pretty much the cost of two buckets. Uh, that's a very efficient use of resources. And you can see the bees are not having any trouble with it whatsoever. Um, I found this today, actually, this picture. I've got one of these kicking around. I was wondering what to do with it. It's a dog waterer that we're not using. <laughs> so I think I'm going to repurpose that. <laughs> uh, but there are a bunch of different designs out there. The other one that's very common, getting back to your point, is the bucket feeder that is an open bucket feeder. Um, and the idea of an open bucket feeder is that you put a bucket of feed out and you put some material on top of the water so that the bees can land on it and take the feed and fly away without drowning. And as they eat that feed, that floating material slowly goes down the bucket, okay, with the, with the feed. And eventually what you're left with is a dry bucket full of, full of dry floating material. Um, you can use wooden blocks. Uh, you want more than this. Um, I have done this with wooden blocks. You want to pretty much cover the surface with wooden blocks. I just took a bunch of scrap and ran it through the table saw, you know, threw them in the bucket until they filled the bucket about that deep, poured five gallons of syrup in, set it up in the field. <clears throat> Works fine. Uh, you can just grab grass and just keep stuffing grass or straw or hay or whatever you want in there. Trees, sticks, anything to keep the bees from drowning can work. Uh, Tracy came back from uh, one of her uh, one of her seminars uh, with uh, a commercial device that is designed to do just this. This floats and it, and it gives a chance for the bees to, to ride it down. Or here's a homemade one and I made out of a sheet of plywood. Any of these can work. What's the downside? Huh? You're feeding everybody, right? No matter how good your setup is, you're going to end up with an inch or two of dead bees in the bottom. <laughs> Okay, because bees are just drown themselves. I don't know what they do, but they find a way to drown themselves. Um, it, if you get a lot of rainy weather, your syrup gets kind of thin, okay, because it's just open. Uh, and uh, you, you kind of, any, any kind of open feeder, uh, you're kind of creating an area where most people are not going to want to hang out. Because this is going to be really, really popular with the bees. And I don't mean just a few bees. I mean, tens of thousands of bees all the time. And the yellow jackets. And the yellow jackets. All right, next slide, Paul. Oh. Lastly, um, we don't just feed syrup. Um, we uh, sometimes in the spring will feed pollen substitute as well. You can feed it inside the hives in the form of patties, obviously. If you want to do that, I encourage you to use a half or a third of a patty at a time. Because the only thing that likes pollen sub better than bees are hive beetles. Uh, and you will raise a, a bumper crop of hive beetles. Feeding it externally um, is not a bad way to go. Uh, there are some commercial uh, designs like this one here uh, that are designed to fill the center of this column with dry pollen substitute. The bees come in these radial arms and they haul it away. It keeps the pollen sub from getting wet in the weather. Uh, you can make yourself one, actually, out of a piece of three-inch PVC and a couple of fittings that are designed for uh, downspouts. Put that on one end, put a closed cap on the other, hang in the tree, throw a couple of pollen sub in there, and the bees will go after it like nobody's business. So that's it. Uh, hopefully that's given you some ideas. Just remember, uh, if you stimulate broodery, you're going to get brood. And when you get a lot of brood, you're going to get a hive that wants to swarm. So Pay attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, Swarmy. If you catch a swarm, uh -huh. okay, uh, they have no food, so obviously they're supposed to put it in a brain tube or something. Would it be a good idea to feed them? I, I, I would, I, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's first, it's a misnomer they don't have any food. Because, oh. depending, well, yeah, they're really stores, but depending on how long they've been out, they've gorged themselves. So, and so when they are put into a box, they are ready to build wax. But yes, I tend to feed any new hive, whether it's a swarm or whether it's a package or, or a split, I feed. Yeah. Any other questions? Do they stop feeding them? Right. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>
Thank me. Jim, can you use yeah. your clicker? Can you use your clicker? Oh, yeah, yeah. Keep giving the remote. It's working. Yeah. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Kurt Hadley, and I am with a nonprofit called Field Watch. So, my first question for everybody, and I think I, I've had this question asked a little bit earlier, but how many of you are new beekeepers and you've not heard of bee check? Everybody's heard of bee check? We have. Okay, so, so we've, got, we've got a mix. We've got some, some that have and some that have. So, what bee check is, and we're going to get to that in just a second, but bee check is a register that allows beekeepers to map their hives so that pesticide applicators so the commercial farm pesticide applicators the hopefully the mosquito uh, mitigation sprayers uh, turf grass sprayers all those types of pesticide applicators assuming that they are also registered and looking at our data they will be aware of where your beehives are and again the goal of what we do is promoting communication and stewardship such that those pesticide applicators can make better decisions when they go out to put on any type of a pesticide and hopefully communicate with you the beekeeper when they're getting ready to do that now what i will tell you is that we are not policy we are not any type of regulation but we are a free and voluntary service that both the beekeepers also, especially crop producers and the applicators use. And from our perspective, because we've been around since 2008, and we were started up by a need by a central Indiana tomato processor. And I think you probably all know who that is in Red Bull, but they had hundreds of thousands of dollars of crop loss every year because it's crazy. So they came to Purdue and said, hey, how can we solve this issue? Produce that there's this kind of cool thing called Google Maps. I think it'll work. That's kind of where it all blew up from there, right? So that was 2008. From 2008 until 2012, we grew like gangbusters and we were spun out as a nonprofit in 2012. So fast forward to where we're at today, we now exist in 23 US states, one Canadian province, and you can see the number of individual users registered site. So a site is either an apiary site, could be one beehive, it could be a site with 300 hives in all of them. But those are all each you know, classified as a site. Could also be a field. Could be a field that's 1.5 acres, it could be a field that's 1,500 acres. But you'll see that, and, and I think my number's a little bit off there, but I think we now are a little bit closer to about 1.6 million mapped acres. So do we have a lot? Yes, but when you take a look at that across those 23 states, there's still a lot of open area and a lot of places that, that really could be mapped. So pay no attention to the fact that I left Iowa up there. We get a lot of presentations, we work in a lot of states, so forget that says Iowa. And you really can't see it well, but that is actually a map of just the state of Indiana, and those are just beehives in the state of Indiana. When I all of the other crop types. So those are just beehives. And there are other states that are even more dense with beehives. Iowa, South Dakota, the numbers are just absolutely staggering. But here in Indiana, you know, we've got roughly 9,300 beehives, and that's across 2,000 apiaries. So we've got quite a few mapped here in Indiana. And so how does it work, right? It's, it's very simple. It's all web-based, like I said, it's Google Maps based. So a grower or a beekeeper can set up an account and they can enter, enter your locations. For the beekeepers, we made it much simpler. We've got a mobile app on both Android and Apple. For a beekeeper, that's easily the easiest way to, to work. You don't even need to fool with a desktop application. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. I've got a couple of QR codes up here as well that you can snap to take you to sign up. But I also left one here at the table so if you want to look at that later, you can do that as well. But the, the key to all of this is the applicators looking at that data. We've had all the bees in 
every uh, every one of the lower 48 states map. But if we didn't have pesticide applicators looking at this data, it's a waste. So we've developed a different portal specifically for the applicators called Field Check. They also have a mobile app, but and I'll get to this in just a second. Many of the commercial ag applicators also pull their data in from a precision ag platform. So literally, you see a guy out spraying in the field working for Nutrient or one of the larger commercial applicators. They have a screen and they have a drop down. They can say, give me the field watch data and they can overlay it and see exactly where things are at. The hope is that those folks, as they plan their spring for tomorrow, they will look and see where there are beekeepers and hopefully they will reach out to you because as I'll show you here in a second, when you get to that point, maybe. So again, these are just some of the software partners that the big ag folks use. It's just there to show you that nearly every one of those software platforms we work with and they pull that data in. So they have the ability to see that data and it's just, it's brutally simple for them. I'm not gonna walk all through this because this is really more of how the applicators access the data, but it's just there to show you that the applicators have full access to this data and can see everything that you've got out there and got back. And so again, the mobile apps are really probably the most simple way for folks to use because with the mobile app, obviously if you have your GPS turned on, it's gonna follow you and tell you right where you're at. So if you wanna place two hives right here, all you have to do is stand there and place the hives. I mean, it's, it's really brutally simple. So when the applicator is looking at that information, let's say the day before, and they drill into this particular uh, beekeeper, some of you might know Mike, he's uh, not far from here, but they can drill into that and say, okay, where I'm spraying is not far from my six hives. So hopefully, you know, in an ideal world, that applicator is going to reach out to Mike the day before and say, hey, Mike, it looks like I should be spraying tomorrow morning. Would you like to meet your hives closed up or would you, do, would you want to do something like that? I'm not going to tell you that every applicator does that, but we got a lot of data to say that a lot of them do. We did a survey pretty extensively last summer, and we got a lot of feedback from beekeepers, from applicators, and from crop growers, and the overwhelming response was, I am being contacted, they are working well with me, because in today's world, we don't always know who that neighbor is, right? We might know maybe who owns that land, but we might not know this year who's cash renting it. We might not know who's doing all of the you know, pesticide applications, but with a tool like this, it's really easy for everybody to see who's where. And this is really the beauty of, of what we do and why we do it. So again, this is really more for some of the companies and people that support us, but why do they want to partner with us? You know, there's a, there's a, a ton of reasons why they want to partner with us, but the bottom line is it shows that they are being responsible in what they do. And again, you can take a look at our website, but we've got some of the large chemical companies. We've got many of the large commercial applicators that fund what we do. Again, as a nonprofit, our applications are free and voluntary to use. So our funding comes from those sponsors and also comes from the states. So if we start up a new state, oops, one too far. If we start up a new state, there's a cost for that state to enter into a relationship with us. So there's a one-time fee and then there is an annual maintenance fee. So a good example of that is right now, we're in the process of bringing West Virginia in this month. Getting all the paperwork done, but West Virginia will be coming in this month. And again, there's, there's you know, some cost there for them. But, so we've got the sponsors, we've got trade associations, and we've got all kinds of people it's almost, when you break it down, it's almost a crowdfunding type of a model as a nonprofit, right? We've got a lot of folks that understand, appreciate, and support what we do. And that brings us to, to really where we're at today. You know, 10 plus years in, and we're still going strong. We're adding new states. 
uh, you know, we've got a handful of additional states that we're in discussions with and working with right now. You might have seen some of these signs. We also offer through our website the ability to go and, and buy these signs. We try to limit who buys these signs to the folks that actually have something mad with us. So that's kind of our clearing point. There might be a, a, a time every now and then when somebody says, hey, my neighbor is using your, your register. Can I buy signs? We, we might allow that. But the nice thing is, when sign orders come through, we see the sign orders come through, and we can vet it against our database of who's a user. So it's, it's pretty simple, but we'll see a lot of these signs. And it's interesting because I've only been with Fieldwatch for just a little over a year. I came on board last January. But I was very aware of these signs all over the state and everywhere. So when I first took a look at this, it was those signs, specifically those specialty crop and no drift signs that made me aware of, of who we were and, and what we do. There we go. So again, it's very simple to sign up. I'm not going to walk you through what it takes to set up an account, but it's literally simple. And again, I've got those same QR codes over here. The first one just simply takes you to a web browser where you can log in. But the other two are the, but the first one is the Android mobile app, and the second one is the Apple mobile app. Again, that's really all I've got. And again, the big, the big takeaway is our purpose in life is to promote that communication between the beekeepers, the pesticide applicators, and the crop growers to minimize those spray drift issues and those bee kill issues. Any questions? I have a pipeline access to get to my property, and every year, and I have actually three different pipelines to come through. Every year, I have to fight with them trying to get them to not spray. So it's obvious that they're not using this. The, the, so yeah, they're obviously not aware. So so one of the one of the regulations, if you will, or uh, you know, the best way is regulation. Every pesticide, herbicide, or insecticide, fungicide on the label has a place in it. Almost every one of them that says. The applicator must look at a sensitive crop or sensitive asset beehive registry to see anything that is potentially at risk before they spray. We don't ever want to be called by name in that label, right? That's a little bit too big brother. That's a little bit too much government intrusion. We don't want to be that by name, but in North America, we are the only registry. So, so when you run into somebody, that isn't following this, the best thing to do is, number one, try and figure out who those folks are that are making those applications. Make a couple phone calls and find out, are they aware of drift launch? Because again, when we did that survey last year, we found numerous people that said there was a spread doing ditch side work, doing right away work, you know, easement work or whatever. And when we asked them if they were aware of drift watch, many of them, deer in the headlights look went, oh gosh, I'm busted. Or, no, I'm not aware. Okay, go check it out. Now when they see it, now it holds them to a higher level of accountability because now that information's there. Once it's there, once they see it, they can't avoid it. So does that mean people won't still make bad decisions? Some people are always going to make bad decisions, right? I don't care if it's driving down the road or if it's spraying, but this helps hold folks accountable. There was another question. Are you finding that cities are using it for mosquitoes? So, so I'm glad you brought that up. So we actually just brought on the registry uh, late last year in Washington, D.C just because of all of the urban beekeepers in D.C. Within the Beltway, and, and D.C. is only about 68 square miles, 
ton of beekeepers in DC, they wanted to be on our register. And, and that's, a, that's a group that we are starting to work with more. And it was really because of DC. So, so I'm, I'm presenting at a conference next week. It's now virtual, it's uh, been changed, but it's the Mid-Atlantic Mosquito uh, Applicators Association. And we work with those folks quite a bit, and we've got a lot of those commercial mosquito you know, mitigation folks, as well as other types of commercial pesticide applicators that really are paying attention to what we do. Uh, we've got turf grass folks, We've got golf course folks, and it's surprising, but in almost every one of the states that we work, the state folks that do spraying on the highways and things like that, they're all taking, taking note of it. Because the bottom line is the state is helping fund what we do, and it's amazing how many of those folks really, really do. So in as much as we get out there and share that information, with those folks, um, there was a, a conference here at Purdue back in January. And again, it was a pest management conference. Uh, we were there, and I was really surprised that there were quite a few of the larger pest management folks that, number one, were aware of what we did, and were also really paying attention specifically to the bees. The ones that weren't aware, we made them aware. And again, we really think that it helps them with visibility to the public. Now, what I would like to think is if somebody's going to do mosquito spraying in your area, they would see your hives, they would contact you, and, but I'll be honest, the mosquito spraying is probably one of the biggest concerns for bees that we have. We attend the Indiana Pesticide Review Board meetings monthly, and there are a lot of discussions specifically here in Indiana about mosquito spraying because, and again, I'm not going to get too, too far into the weeds of it, but the concern is the equipment and the things they use to spray mosquitoes are made to drift and fall, right? They're made to cover a large area. It's a death nail beach. So that, that and in terms of this state and other states, there's still a lot of things that they're looking at to try and protect uh, specifically bees in other areas, but mosquito spraying is probably the biggest risk in urban and suburban areas that, that we're going to have. I have a neighbor that does spray for mosquitoes. Um, how can I protect my hive? I mean, other than discuss it with them, is there a time that it's effective? Like in the next day, it's still a problem. So the only answer I would have for that is to try to find out from your neighbor what is being sprayed and look at those labels because there are so many different things out there. Um, and that's the one thing that, that we also don't do and we're not extremely knowledgeable of is all of the different you know pesticides and that. But here in Indiana. We work directly with the Indiana Office of the State Chemist. So if there are ever questions, they are truly the pesticide uh, you know, clearinghouse here in Indiana. And the Indiana Office of the State Chemist is really an extension of Purdue. It might not sound like it, but it is. So they are the ones that really you know, can answer any of those questions. Do you have to re-register every year, or is it um, do you register at the first year? Man, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Mm -hmm. So, so in terms of data integrity, we require everybody that has a site on the map this year to re-register next year. And in fact, this is a period of time right now when we do a re-registration. So, the way we've got it set up, for the most part. Unless folks choose their own expiration dates, which we try to keep them away from, right now, crop sites expire at the end of March, and beehives expire at the end of April. So if any of you out there are currently using us, you probably received an email at least this week that says, it's time to renew. And we've changed things a little bit this year to make that renewal a bit easier. 
So rather than you getting that renewal email and you have to click and log in, we work with our developers and there is simply a link that you can click to renew everything without even logging in. It's actually so quick that it confuses some people, but it, but yeah, in terms of data integrity, we really make sure that every site is renewed every year because we never know whether it's a crop site, uh, whether it's a large commercial apiary or what it might be. And again, because we're in that time period right now, we get a lot of folks sending us emails saying, sold the beads, we sold the vineyard, we sold whatever, please remove us. And that's that's that point where we say, okay, we're doing this right. We want to make sure that a pesticide applicator doesn't go out to spray and see on the map that there are 30 beehives. And he says, those, those hives are gone, right? So yeah, that, that's a very good question. Thank you. Well, hey, I appreciate everybody uh, having me here. And again, I left a couple of things here, but any questions, feel free to reach out to us. It's real easy to contact us through the website. And again, we're, we're here to help protect these. You bet. Take a break. Yeah, five minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Five minutes, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. 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 I just got my email a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Renew all. <laughs> yeah. and, and like I said, it's, it's actually. It was easier, yeah. Well, and when you, if you got yours early on, uh, we had some issues. It worked fine for me. Well, did you renew on a device like this? Or yeah, I was on this. So yeah, I, just, I got the email. I said, Renew all. On the phone, and, and I found this before we ever sent those out, you can have a mobile site that is formatted for your phone, right? But I, didn't, I didn't realize this until we started talking to the developers, but most of those mobile sites, there's just a simple M before the URL, so it tells you it's mobile. And we didn't have, and we've never had yet, set up mobile sites. But somehow that M got in there for B-Check, so people would do that one click link to renew, and then on the phone it would immediately want them to log in and show them a broken page saying you can't log in. I can't tell you how many emails we got saying there's something wrong and I did I had a simple cut and paste. No, nothing's wrong. Your renewal is fine. We're working on it. But, yeah. but we've now got that fixed. Yeah, I, I've been in the system for years. Um, and I remember this was a couple years it was log in and yes, this site, you know, yeah, I think in one of the first years, I might have had to like remark my sentence. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's definitely gotten better over the years, and it was I mean, it was good for me. I started last year at right around the middle, of the and it was sort of baptism by fire. I spent a lot of time with the renewal process, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the new guy, but this is this is this is you. So long, long list for developers of got to fix this, this, and this. And you know, one of the things that we're working on next year is instead of just a simple one-click link, a place where you can go and it would still require a login and like not, but a drop-down. So you can say, I want to be new all of these times. I want to remove all of these times. You know, simple toggle on, toggle off, check the block. Because we get so many large commercial users, whether yeah. it's beekeepers. Yeah, you got thousands of high sizes. Well, and California is a screwed up state, but yeah. uh, I mean, that's all I'm going to say about that. But they have a mandatory beekeeper, and their site is tied into ours. So right now, just in California alone, out of that you know, nearly 500,000 beehives, and we had a commercial beekeeper just last week said, hey, sold my bees, I'm no longer, and I went look, and I went, this guy's got, you know, 
was in rehab, and he wants me to it's going to be a life of love. But when I finally went and looked, he had several hundred at each site in the Army Road. So it was pretty simple. But we've got some crop growers that might have a couple hundred dollars. Okay, appreciate all your help. Right. Have a good one. This is streaming to YouTube. Um, why do you end up doing this? To try to simplify what we have to just get a tripod mount from the phone. Tie the phone to the tripod. Try to do Not do the camera, not the camera. Tripod, clip in a camera, take a power to the
one's yours?
And if you want, if you're interested, maybe determine what the cause was. Two years ago, there was a presentation, the entire presentation was how to read the clues of the dead out and determine what caused it. I'm not going to go into any of that today. So the equipment you're going to need for your spring evaluation, uh, high fuel smoker, spare room frames, um, the feeders, as Jim talked about, uh, maybe a mini nuke if uh, you need to start splitting your hive, and some supers, depending on how late you are uh, doing the evaluations. I read that uh, recommend that you replace the room frames uh, every five years is the recommendation. Uh, they do absorb the contaminants, the chemicals that come in, that the bees track in, and then they walk all over the wax and they get real dark. Uh, so the pesticides and, and the pollutants. Um, and I read, my surprise, that the cells shrink every time uh, it's used. Because even though the first thing the adult bee does after they emerge is to clean out the cells so it can be used again, is they do leave a small layer of the cocoon when they incubate it in the cell. And if there's three, four, five generations in the summer, and after five years, you know, that's a lot of uh, leftover uh, residue there. So rather than replacing all 10 frames in your root box and then forcing the colony to draw out all new homes uh, that summer, one recommendation is every year replace two frames. And they probably use the same color coding that we do when marking the queens. And so this year, ending in a one, you will replace the, the yellow. This year ends in and two. two to replace the yellow. That's right. Uh, Jim taught me last month, I didn't know what the uh, mnemonic was. It's will you raise good bees, <laughs> which is a very easy mnemonic. So that goes one through five, and then six through 10, you just repeat uh, the sequence. And I told my wife, that's a very easy mnemonic to remember, a lot easier than the one I was asked to learn in college, which was this one. Uh, Luster Brown races our young girls and five generally wins. And that just had a hard time with that. Okay, so what are we looking for after we uh, clean out the dead outs? We're looking for uh, a healthy laying queen. The one way to tell if you have a queen is to spot the queen, and in the early spring, there's fewer bees, you might have better luck doing that. Uh, me and my wife, it was, uh, I think it's our third summer before we got good at spotting the queen, so you may not spot her. Um, the next thing to look for would be the eggs, because if you see eggs, you know that she laid them within the last three days because eggs hatch uh, that quick. But eggs are very hard to see. They're smaller than a grain of rice. She glues them at the bottom of the cell, standing on end, so you're looking at the smallest cross section. And that's why I wear uh, Jupiter glasses underneath my veil, so I can flip it down and, and try to look for the eggs, but I still can't see them. Uh, the next thing to do, we got to have the light just right. Uh, you can easily see the larva. And the thing you want to look at for the larva, are they swimming in a, a good pool of royal jelly, uh, honey, and bee bread? Uh, if they're not, if they look dry, then definitely need to be feeding them because they're not having enough liquid there. But to really assess the health of the queen is not just see that okay, she was there and she laid a few eggs, but how good is the brood pattern? And by the time you get in there in March, if the queen isn't she laying probably now, is that right? And so by the time you look in March, you might have a, a full frames of cat brood. And that's really going to let you know well, is that a healthy queen because she's laying a good uh, pattern there. And this one you see down at the bottom, the drone brood. You have cat honey up in the corners, pollen in the lower corners. You see a lot of open cells. Uh, you will always see open cells in a frame of cat brood. Uh, this looks up to me uh, more than I'm experienced in seeing uh, typically. I've read several different theories of why you have uh, the empty holes. Uh, this might have been a situation, took a picture as a lot of bees have emerged. 
I remember last summer I was looking through my eye with and showing it off my son, and just as we pulled the frame out, 12 beads at once came out, and it was kind of really neat to see. Um, I've also read a theory, and I don't know if this is true or not, that as they're having them, if they detect mites in there on the larva, that they will pull the larva out and discard it. I don't know if that's true. I did read about that they'll leave open cells for the heater beads that will go in and vibrate their flying muscles just like they do to heat up the, uh, the core in the, in the, uh, the wintertime. And they'll warm up to, to 70 of the bees or the pupa around them. And a degree, a degree and a half will encourage those, those bees will then develop faster to be field bees. And then the lower temperature ones will be house bees. And so depending on the needs of the colony, whether or not they'll need to heat it up and, and grow more foragers. You also then will be looking for queen cells. So if a queen, if the bees decide that it's not producing enough uh, eggs or they're not uh, fertilizing them into worker bees, or maybe sometime during the summer, you accidentally dropped her and stepped on her and didn't know it. Uh, within an hour, I've read that uh, Colony can tell that their queens, their pheromones have dissipated. dissipated. So what they have to do is they have to go and find an egg that hasn't hatched, or a larva that's only a day or two old that hasn't been fed honey and uh, pollen because the queen doesn't get the, uh, the plant food, just the royal jelly. And then they also they'll build out one of the young uh, larva right there in the middle of the frame, being the successor. So that's what we call the super senior cell. If it's a swarming, if the colony has decided it's time to split the hive and swarm off, and the queen is going to take half of these with her, they will build the queen cups at the bottom of the frame and have the queen uh, put the eggs in there so she knows what's going on. And this is a plan thing. Um, I'm told that uh, if you have two brood chambers, those uh, swarm cells will be at the bottom of the top. Frames. And for some beekeepers, we just lift up the box and look what they're there for. So when I found those uh, last year, we took them out trying to prevent the swarming and put them in our two frame new gear with another frame. And once the queens emerged, uh, then transferred those into a five frame new. And what I ended up doing was creating or doing the split myself rather than letting the bees do it, and then I kept both paths. Um, it seemed to work. And if we needed to later in the spring or in the, the summer needed the, the queens, we had them uh, handy to do that. But they say once uh, the swarm cells are cast, there's probably nothing you can do to convince a colony not to swarm or to swarm. And so what I uh, will move those uh, queen cells and we've had very good success in growing the queens and turning those. We went from two colonies to six by the end of the summer. We were built this way uh, this last summer. It, it does work. I don't know if I lost uh, part of the colonies anyway just for me, but I think the number of eyes I have. My wife gets to take care of me. That's all I have, man. Comments, questions? I'm at the end, and I talk fast. That's the Buffalo, New York, and me. So you guys are good. So, I take too long. so this is the new segment we started this year. And it's uh, oh, basically the beekeeping calendar. I'm not touching it. No buttons yet. Tell me when. Are you in this one? No, no. It's called the beekeeper's calendar. Sorry. So I'm going to talk about the beekeeper's calendar. So my name is Dave Zubakowski, everybody. Dave C. So I am a this is my fifth year of beekeeping. My mentor is Jim Burr, um, Tracy to some degree too, and, and other folks that are that are in our club with Dave and Peggy and uh, and uh, some others that are out here. The Murphys in general should just say thank you. But um, having mentors is really important. Uh, that's part of how you you know where it is. Beekeeping calendar, February, March. 
This one? Okay. So this is really, it's February, March. So we just got a lot of these together. Um, this is a really important time. When do you think you're going to lose hives? All year long. Well, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah, early spring. Early spring, this is the time. Late winter, early spring. The hives are, there's a lowest number of bees in the hive. There's still mites in there doing their thing. And the stores can run low. So between all of that, it's a tough time for the bees. If you didn't do some of the things in the fall, like build a good, strong hive going into winter, and talk, and talk about previous things. So, um, so I've got a combination of hives. I've got I started with top bar hives, so a whole different kind of thing. Not vertical, not a horizontal hive with standard laying frames, but just a bar and let the bees do their comb naturally. That's so a good looking apiary, apiary, dude. That is a good looking apiary, Jim. Whatever that could be. Um, so it's a different kind of beekeeping, and last year I started lanes, lanes the lane straw hives for the first time. So I've got two two kind of setups going, um, and I, I, I really love top bar beekeeping, but you get more honey out of these things. So if you're in it for the honey, right there. You get the the top is kind of fun. You just you get manipulated really easily, the less damage to the queen and the comb and everything. So it's a nice way to do it. Um, that is Jim Burt's. Apiary, by the way, and that is at the location we're talking about in June 4th for uh, Teeter Park. He's got about 20, 30 hives out there, lots of room for all of us to work, and I do highly recommend that. So sign up for that in June if you haven't. Um, so, what are they do doing right now in February and March? Well, they're still chilling and clustering. That's most of their, that's what they're basically doing. Days like today, when it's above 50 degrees, they're all flying around. Um, they're cleansing, they're getting ready. For, uh, for a lot of activity coming up in the next month or so. This is a really busy time. The hive is small. The queen's laying. She is laying a lot of eggs right now. So there's not a lot of adult bees. The hive has got the lowest number of adult bees right about now. But she is laying eggs. So what does that mean? You gotta feed them. So there, she's laying eggs, they're getting low on food. All those different things can kind of coalesce into a real problem if you don't have enough food. So that's a real big deal. Um, so you should be laying strong by early March if added for food. Um, still consuming 20 plus pounds of honey each month or more. So you know that's 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 a lot of honey. Um, they're pounding through it. Um, you know you have to start bringing. They're going to start bringing in materials from from nature right now, which is good. Um, red maples and uh, silver maples are the earliest ones. You guys know those. Get those warm days in early March and you walk through the neighborhood and you see all the bright stuff on after a windstorm. All those red buds everywhere. That's from the maple trees. All those crappy silver maples that they put like in every little boulevard strip in <laughs> every city in the country. You know, crappy trees that tear up system, you know, root systems, and the root systems tear up uh, all the all the sewers and everything. They're a real pain. But it's a short course for bees. You can plant all these little flowers you want, crocuses and everything. You think of one silver maple tree. How many flowers do you think are on one silver maple tree? Like uh, millions. So it's a total smorgasbord. So all of those trees are just like the best food at all for bees. Um, so risk of starvation, like I started, is common. So if bees are being made right now, they're laying eggs, and you've got bees growing. What else is growing inside those cells while those bees are turning into flying bees? Those larvae. Mites. Mites are still doing their thing. So there's mites, and mites are in the hive. So that's a row mite right there. Not Jim's hive. Nasty. What's that? Not Jim's hives. Not my no, hives. No, no, not Jim's hives. hives. Yeah. But most of us have these dark things in here. They're nasty. <laughs> they're disgusting. And uh, they sit on our bees and, and suck their juices up, which is just not cool. So I don't like them. Nobody likes them. So you got to take care of them. Um, this is the time of year to start the process. You don't want to wait necessarily until the fall. You need to start doing that and thinking about that now. So what should beekeepers be doing? This is stuff from last time, schools, clubs, reading, planning, resting. Um, but really it comes down to uh, what are the bees doing and what are the, what are the beekeepers have to do. And what we have to do is if you don't have bees, get yourself a nuke. These are a couple hundred bucks, these are 180. This comes with frames. You know, if you got frames in there, there's bees and everything. So if you are gonna have to either buy a nuke or a package for the, I don't know, 30 or 40 bucks between the two. It's just the only way to go. And you got your own colors and it's, you got a, a, a colony already, as opposed to a potentially failing queen, um, a, a bucket of syrup that is probably almost empty. 
and bees that are just not overly happy with them throughout our country. Get that from a local beekeeper, one of those nukes. Okay, there's my plug for a nuke. Um, painting hives, building, assembling new hives, all that stuff is things that you need to be doing now. Painting should be going as we speak. So a warm day, get out, paint those hives up, not hives that got bees in them, I don't think. I've never really done that. Why hive? You probably don't want to do that because the bees are going to be mouth price stick. So don't do that. So just do it on the ones in the garage, the extras that you have, okay? Um, pest control, start buying that if you haven't already, pick it up. Aether bar, oxalic acid, whatever you like to use, those are the things that I use. Um, and you can start considering applying these now. All right. Um, dead bees, snow, you know, if you have entrances at your hives and you got a pile of snow or ice, you want to clear that up, keep it clear. If it's less than 50 degrees, don't really mess with the hive. Just let the bees do their thing. If it gets above 50, take a quick look in there. Make sure there's food. You should be able to lift the cover up and just see in the in the, uh, the top cover, the little hole that's there. There's bees coming out of that thing, and you don't have the sugar on there. You can look down in there, and they're, they're that high in the hive. They're probably getting lean on food. Um, it's probably a good idea to feed them. And it's not uncommon this time of year. Most of you guys probably put a candy board like that on there. So above that, those top, the top of the hive, you've got some sugar that they're eating. That's okay. They're eating sugar, that's, that's food for them. So that works. Um, you can check the weight of a hive too to make sure there's enough food. And uh, you know, Dave just likes to pick up those 60 pound boxes. <laughs> that's what he does. Uh, you can give a little bump, whatever you need to do. Um, but you want to make sure there's food in there. Supplement, if you need to feed, feed. Get on it, add sugar to the top. You can use dry sugar right over the bars if you have to. You can have a little newspaper put it out of there. You can get fondant. You can probably not liquid when it's really cold out. Um, I don't do that until it gets a little warmer out typically, but I don't know how other guys feel about that or other folks in here. Um, but I don't really do that that year, or that time of year. And then lastly, it's uh, tree mites. Before you get a whole pile of bees in there, there's an advantage of trying to take care of mites. And Dave and I were just talking about that too. If you're going to do oxalic gas and vaporization, if you want to do that when it's, you know, not when it's 30 degrees out. You don't want to do it when it's 60 and they're all flying out there. You want to find that sweet spot, 40, 40, 45 degrees, when they're kind of warming up and they're kind of breaking cluster a little bit, but they're not flying out, leaving the hive. That's when you want to put your oxalic in. That'll pretty much treat everything in that hive and, and wipe out a lot of your uh, mites. Um, you can use apron bar strips. Some people do it in early spring. I don't know, Jim, I think you're an apron guy in early spring. So you put them in in the next couple of weeks. Something like that. Uh, right about now. Yeah. So you can use that too as an option. But you want to get on it at, at the very least if it's a warm enough day. I don't, I normally don't do a like a, like a sugar roll or anything yet. I don't know, you guys probably not. You don't want to go bust the high open too much this time of the year. Um, if you get an exceptionally warm few days, I suppose you can get in there, but you don't want to really go shifting. It's tempting to start trying to move stuff around. I've got myself in trouble doing that. I think the bees kind of know where stuff is and how they're doing things. Um, sometimes less is more with beekeeping. You're trying to, you, sometimes you try to do too many manipulations, especially in the spring, and, uh, and you can cause problems because it does get colder. The bees kind of know where stuff is, and all of a sudden they're like, wait, I thought the honey was over there. It gets cold, and they're done. Um, let's see, anything else here? I think that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, anything else to add from the other experienced beekeepers here? I would add one thing. That's the yeah. only good use I've ever found for a speedy board. Put it in this time of the year. You don't have to check the lines to the frame if you can tell what you got or not by using that slide and going under your screen. Yeah. Um, I just told Peg, I put Apivar in before the holidays, so I would like to be getting it out pretty soon and had to get my husband to lift the hive so I could get it in where I wanted it. And my eyes popped open the other day and I realized. We didn't mark which box we put it in, so now I don't know which oh. one it's in. So, if you're going to put them in, put a little thumbtack or a mark or something so you know where they are, so when you go to get them back out, you don't have to open, 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 open. Yeah. or write notes down or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, this, 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 we're, we're mellow for a little couple of weeks, and then it starts warming up, and it's time to start. Warm days, take a look at the hive and start seeing what we do. And again, the biggest thing with beekeeping is just observation. 
take a look at the hive. It's easy to know what's going on. Look at what's happening. If there's if you see problems, then identify those. Talk to your bee mentor or somebody that knows more than, than you may. And uh, that, can, that can help because I get I've had a lot of weird situations where I just don't know the answer. Should I mess with it? Should I not? Should I do this? Ask somebody. Put it on Facebook so you can get the question out. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we're all very welcoming. <laughs> We'll all give you an idea. So yeah, don't expect us to answer. Did you have any bees? Hundred, hundred million years. If we only keep them for about six hundred thousand years, they can grow up to six hundred thousand years. That is excellent advice. That's what that's what Jim always told me. It's like, when in doubt, don't do a damn thing. Do nothing. 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 Uh, are we still selling tickets? Last call. <laughs>